Hello lovely people, the leaves on the trees outside of my flat have officially turned red and yellow, which means it is autumn. If you watch my channel for a while, you know that I'm not the biggest TBR person unless I'm taking part in a readathon. Autumn changes that. Every single time autumn rolls around, I find myself craving very specific things, and I often crave the same things every autumn. I've decided to do what I did last year, which is set myself a specific, like, autumn TBR. I will be reading more books than just these over the course of autumn. It's just, I find it really interesting to know about what people crave in certain seasons, so I thought I would condense my little cravings and then the books that are on my radar to read for those cravings into one video. And then also I'm hoping that you guys can let me know, like, what do you crave in autumn? What are specific, like, vibes or genres or stuff like that that you find yourself really wanting to read when the weather starts to turn? I definitely have things that are, like, recurring. Um, I thought just before I do that I would just dive into what I am currently reading as of recording. Um, because these kind of tap into those cravings as well. So I've just finished Buddy Reading with Olive over at A Book Olive. We've just been Buddy Reading Remarkable Creatures by Tracy Chevalier, which was one of my uh, five-star book predictions. Um, I will wrap this up in my autumn reading wrap-up, but uh, a little bit disappointed to say that it didn't quite live up to it for me, but we'll dive into all of that later. But that was um, kind of an autumnal craving because it felt like something that would be um, fun to read about in this time. What I am reading that I'm hoping is going to be much more dazzling to me, The Secrets of Jin Shea by Alma Alexander. This was on my radar because um, another booktube friend, Matt, over at MCS Books, this is one of his favourite books. He's done a number of videos on it, which I've never watched because I was like, I, sh I will read the book and then I will watch these videos and then I just never read the book, but I'm changing that. This is set in medieval China. Um, as far as I'm aware, I'm literally this far into it, so I don't really know a lot yet. Um, we're following a number of different characters who are all women, they come from different, um, like, class, different backgrounds, that sort of stuff. And then there's this bond of Jin Shea, which, from what I can gather, is, at its most simplistic, a bond of friendship, but it is something that comes with um, not just the joys of friendship, but also there are, like, responsibilities that come with it. And by entering Jin Shea with someone, you create this bond of reciprocity and stuff like that. That's what I've gathered from, again, <laughs> this far in. Um, I think that one of these characters is going to be this empress. Um, I just, this feels like one of those books that's going to be very, um, I feel like I'm going to be very immersed in this world. So far it seems like one that's going to take its time, and it's going to take place over a long period of time, but I'm really looking forward to sort of like settling in and like grounding myself in this world and these characters and these bonds and just sort of like seeing where this goes. Um, this is not a time period that I've read about before, so I'm excited to sort of like learn a little bit about a time that I don't really know about. Um, but yes, I'm hoping it's going to be absolutely dazzling. I have promised Matt many updates as I read it, and I'll be sure to report back. The other book that I'm currently reading is um, This Golden Fleece, A Journey Through Britain's Knitted History by Esther Rutter. Um, this, I... <laughs> This is literally as simple as this is a history of like Britain's relationship with wool and knitting and I was like it's becoming autumn I'm going to be wearing my jumpers again shall I read about wool <laughs> that's where my brain went um, but this is really interesting so far um, every chapter is looking at like a different garment so uh, Esther Rutter is um, knitting said garment exploring the history of said garment and then sort of traveling around Britain um, while doing those things it's um, thoroughly enjoyable so far I like that thing where you sort of trace like um, micro and macro histories all at the same time and it's being thoroughly enjoyable I'm going to dive into like my categories that I crave so the first one that always comes around with autumn is fantasy, but specifically like fantasy that might be on the chungier side, or essentially I, I want to feel immersed in things, I think. So last autumn, one of the fantasy books I set myself to read was The Name of the Wind by Patrick Rothfuss, which is a hugely famous fantasy series that a lot of people love. I enjoyed it. Kroth is an interesting main character to follow. I enjoyed getting to know the world. I didn't love it quite as much as a lot of people do, but I had a good time and I want to continue it. Um, so I'm going to read uh, The Wise Man's Fear, which is the second book in this series. I am very interested about this one because I know a lot of people who loved the first book 
who did not like this book but similarly I do also know of people who still absolutely love this book so I'm kind of interested to see where I fall given that I had a thoroughly enjoyable time reading the first book I really enjoyed the time period I read it in like I really enjoyed reading it in autumn because I felt like there was a bit of autumn in the book and that sort of thing um I'm just I'm interested to see why this is a bit of a controversial one it's very highly rated on Goodreads it's just I have also seen a lot of people who really did not like it so I'm going to see what I think. I don't want to give too much of a plot setup because it's the second book in a series and spoilers, so I'm going to leave that one there. The other fantasy book I want to read is on my Kindle. That's um, An Ember in the Ashes by Saba Tahir. This has reached that sort of, from my outside perspective, this to me seems like um, a booktube beloved series. I've heard a lot of really good things about it. I know that it's a fantasy world that is inspired by the Roman Empire, and I know that we have two main characters, one of whom is a slave, the other one is a soldier. Um, I'm assuming that somehow they're going to end up banding together and potentially, um, I don't know, the impression I got was maybe like leading a revolution but I don't know if that's correct or if I've imagined that based on this setup that I have. Again I don't actually know too much about this one but I've heard such good things about it on booktube and I, I really am in the mood to settle into some really well beloved fantasy so I'm hoping that those two are going to really fulfill like my fantasy yearnings. Another genre that I find myself craving a lot in autumn is murder mysteries and I didn't have any murder mysteries on my TBR. I decided to pick up another book on my kindle which is An Heir to Murder by booktube's very own Charles Heathcote. I've watched Charlie's channel for a number of years now, I've lost track of how many, and I really love his videos, I love the way he talks about books, but I've never read any of his own books, and I've decided to change that. This follows a woman called Alice whose auntie has died and she's inherited uh, a little cottage. She moves in, but then a retired detective is killed. She ends up embroiled in the investigation, and I'm just, I'm expecting it to be like, um, a cosy lovely murder mystery but also one thing I really like about Charlie is like his sense of humour and I feel like that might be in this text as well so I'm just really excited to try it out and I'm hoping it's going to fulfil all of my little murder mystery needs um, it's sort of linked to murder mysteries is a slightly more general vibe that I always want to read in autumn which is like mysterious atmospheric kind of books so the first one I have for this is like my classic author who I go to for these, and that's Daphne du Maurier. This is the final Daphne du Maurier that I own that I haven't read. There are many more that I haven't read, but I just don't own them. Um, this is my cousin Rachel. This gives me such strong Rebecca vibes because Daphne du Maurier has written quite widely, so she has a lot of books that are completely different genres to each other. This one gives me real Rebecca vibes because... Um, uh, Philip Ashley is our main character who was orphaned at an early age, he's raised by his older cousin, um, the two have like constructed sort of this like um, lovely place for themselves in their big old house. Um, his cousin Ambrose goes on holiday, marries this woman called uh, Rachel, not Rebecca, <laughs> flip of the tongue, um, and then he suddenly dies and so Rachel returns to this estate and Philip finds himself really drawn to her, but there's also this question of, like, how involved was she in Ambrose's death? The reason this gives me such Rebecca vibes is, like, A, this idea of um, how trustworthy are these people, this sort of magnetic woman who people feel drawn to, and then equally, like, this sense of the house itself and the estate itself sort of having its own, like, vibe and that sort of thing. That's what I'm kind of hoping to get from this book but either way I really enjoy Daphne du Maurier as a writer um, and I'm just really excited to try another one of her books. Um, slightly linked to that is Rebecca's Tale by Sally Bowman. I tried to read this earlier this year just after I had reread Rebecca and I think that was a bad idea because I had um, Rebecca so fresh in my mind that I one thing that rubbed me the wrong way about reading this was I felt like the characters had been really changed and they weren't the same characters that I literally just finished reading about. Um, my friend really loves this book and I sort of asked her like like you know if this is how I'm feeling do you think I'll get on with it and blah and she said that she sort of um, comes into this and kind of views it a little bit like a big fan fiction a little bit so it doesn't matter 100% if the characters aren't like spot on um, and she just like enjoys it for what it is so I'm going to try and do the same thing again if I don't get on with it again then I'm going to just accept that it's not the book for me and I'm going to put it in my pile of books to sell and get rid of but this is set 20 years after Rebecca and I believe it is exploring a bit more about Rebecca herself I, I'm, I'm just gonna see. 
I think one thing that I didn't really like is that I personally find all of the characters in Rebecca are very shady. None of them are like morally good people to be. And I felt like this book was trying to make a couple of them out to be like much nicer than I felt like they actually were. So we'll see how I feel. If I don't like it, I'll just give up on it and I'll accept it. But I thought, let's just give it another go. And I do like a chunky one. I do like chunky books in autumn as well. Um, the other book that is, I'm hoping, going to be atmospheric and interesting is English Animals by Laura Kay. I got this through the Queer Book Box subscription. Um, this follows Merka, who gets a job in a country house in rural England. Um, the couple who own it, Richard and Sophie, hey, are chaotic, drunk, and frequently outrageous, but also warm, generous, and kind to Merka. Uh, Richard is involved in taxidermy, and I have to say that taxidermy actually really freaks me out ever since I went to this one museum in Venice that has, like, so much taxidermy in it, and I was just like, hmm. So I don't really love taxidermy, so we'll see how that bit goes. But um, I know that Merka falls in love with Sophie, and um, I just, I feel like it might be a little atmospheric, moody thing. I also feel like the cover feels very autumnal to me, so that might be influencing me there, but we shall see. Another thing I find myself drawn to in autumn is um, books about food, and I think it's because I really like autumnal food, like where I grow up is very much like cider country, and so like cooking with cider, cooking with apples, like autumn feels like the right time for all these things. So I'm going to pick up a book which I've heard so many good things about and I'm so excited for, and also is a sneak peek of a haul that is going to come in a couple of weeks maybe. Um, but this is With the Fire on High by Elizabeth Acevedo. I've heard so many good things about Elizabeth Acevedo's writing, and I'm so excited to read her work for myself. I know that she's also a poet and I'm wondering like if that's going to be apparent in her prose. This follows Emily who wants to be a chef but she also has a very young daughter and she's 17 so there's a lot going on. Um, the blurb says Emily knows though that there are rules she has to play by and yet once she gets cooking her passion to feed will nourish her soul and dreams too. With the fire on high anything is possible. I just, I have such a good feeling about this. I actually picked this up um, because of Jade at Jaded Reader. She's, uh, her mid-year book freakout tag um, just sold me on this book so hard as if I wasn't already sold, but it was the kick up the bum I needed to actually buy it. So this is one that I'm particularly thrilled about and I'm super excited. I have one more vibe, which is, of course, Halloween. So I have a book on my Kindle, which is uh, The Strange Case of the Alchemist's Daughter by Theodora Goss, which is on my radar because of Sam at Sarcasm and Sci-Fi. A book she really influences the books that I buy. <laughs> But this is a book that follows um, the child of uh, Dr. Jekyll from Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde fame. And I believe a lot of the characters in this are sort of like the children of monsters from like classic gothic fiction and stuff like that. One of them is the child of Dr. Moreau, I think one of them is the child of Frankenstein, um, I can't remember the third one, but essentially like um, that was enough to sell me on it, so I picked it up on Kindle and I'm hoping to read it uh, closer to Halloween to get me in the Halloween mood. And I think it's kind of going to be looking at like the legacy of these monsters, but then also I think all of the um, children are daughters of, so I think that's potentially going to be like a really interesting angle. I know it's part of a series, if I like it I will be continuing the series. Another Halloween-y thing I have, which I don't actually have any books for, is I've been really wanting to read more vampire books. I recently read um, Bram Stoker's Dracula, um, Jay Sheridan Le Fanu's Carmilla, and John Polidori's The Vampire, and I really enjoyed reading them. I really enjoyed like going back to these like roots of vampire fiction and sort of looking at the origins, and it has made me want to read vampire fiction. Specifically vampire fiction that's like not necessarily... When I was a child, I read a lot of stuff like The Vampire Diaries, like that sort of thing, which is a little bit more like vampire paranormal, like romancy things. I really want to read like vampire fiction that's more drawing on those original things and not necessarily about romance plots, but about like vampires. <laughs> I don't know, I have like a real craving. I have some books that are on my radar. Um, I'm just sort of putting the call out. If you have any vampire book recommendations, do let me know. A, I probably missed a bunch, and then B, if lots of people recommend ones that are already on my radar, that's going to decide which one I buy, because I'm definitely going to buy a vampire book, I just don't know which one yet. The final three books don't fit any of my specific cravings that are to do with autumn, they just fit cravings that I currently have. The first one of these is The Garden of Evening Mists by Tan Tuan Eng. I keep raving about Tan Tuan Eng, even though I've only read one of his books. This is his other book, I'm really excited for it. It's set in Malaysia, it's looking at the aftermath of World War II, and it's looking at our main character, who's... Um, sister was um, killed in a Japanese camp and um, she's trying to create this garden in memory of her um, and it's sort of got this tricky relationship with this Japanese man who's teaching her and it's sort of looking at like this aftermath kind of thing. 
I recently watched a documentary which was Monty Don's Japanese Gardens where Monty Don was going around Japan and looking at a lot of their gardens and it was really really interesting because I don't really know anything about Japanese gardens but um, it was so interesting and such a uh, intriguing glimpse into this topic that I don't know that I felt like this would be a perfect thing to read now and that I've got that quite fresh in my mind and I've now seen examples of Japanese gardens I think it's going to make consuming that book um, bring it to life a little bit more because I'll have a bit more of an idea of what um, traditional Japanese gardens look like and that sort of thing so I'm really excited for that. Similarly um, the BBC have also had a, a series on that's been called African Renaissance and there have been a number of documentaries that they've been airing as part of that and I've been really enjoying watching them all and it has made me realise how much of African history I don't know. There are certain African countries where I would say I have a vague idea of some parts of their history. I think as a whole it's a continent that my history knowledge is sorely lacking. So these documentaries have been really interesting to help me like learn a bit more but also I've been lent the book um, Dictatorland by Paul Kenyon which is looking at um, not just di African dictators but specifically um, it's split into sections to do with different things. There's like a chocolate chapter, there's like a coffee chapter, and it's kind of exploring these things. This was lent to me initially because my partner was like, I think you would find the chapter on chocolate really illuminating. How bad the main chocolate creators like Cadbury and Nestle and stuff like this, how bad they are with knowing where their chocolate is sourced from and being able to say that there's no child slavery involved and stuff like this. They just like, don't do that. Um, but I've just decided to read the whole thing because I'm like, I feel like this is an area that I know nothing and therefore I should read it. The final book is another book that's been lent to me. It's not really fulfilling any cravings, it's just a book that I've always wanted to read so I'm going to take the opportunity to read it. Um, but that's A Gift of Love by Martin Luther King Jr. This is a collection of some of his most powerful sermons. Always meant to read this. It's been lent to me. I'm going to take the time to read it in autumn. Those are all the books. <laughs> that are on my autumn DVR. I would love to hear, again, that question, what sort of things do you crave in autumn? Um, another question, have you read any of these? Did you like any of them? And equally, do you have recommendations based on the types of things I'm craving? Because I would love to hear them. I would love to have them on my radar and potentially read them this autumn. We shall see. <laughs> Otherwise, that's everything from me this week. I hope you're having the loveliest of days and I will see you next time for something different.